Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is the last, uh, before the closing, the last session. I'm being very selfish here because um, I really want to understand a little bit more about this computational thinking. I submit as a plenary, and then the committee and uh, uh, Roger decide that it should be a, a plenary session instead of a panel. Then I invite Celia, then Gary, and Ms. Perron to be part of this uh, session. I have a few slides just to uh, create a context for this, uh, what we mean by this computational uh, thinking. This is a uh, paper by Seymour, Teaching Children Thinking. That's paper number two, 1971. And he wrote something like this. Uh, the idea that uh, comp computation is not uh, is related to thinking and to learning is already but was already there in 1971, and in fact, every paper that I read about computational thinking, the first two paragraphs mention the work of Seymour Papert. So it's very striking. People know what's happening or what happened before in terms of what Seymour said and the work that we are doing. So then I, I said, this is a good group for us to, to, to play around with this idea, try to understand a little bit what we mean by computational ideas. Then 2006 uh, came in this paper uh, that this somehow, sem somehow uh, define or create this terminology, computational thinking, created by these people from the computer science um, department. And uh, a lot of, as, as, as we mentioned here, um, I think she doesn't define ex exactly what's computational thinking, but it's something that uh, reading, writing, now arithmetic, and now computational thinking. So this is for everybody, and we have now this huge movement that starts, for example, in Europe. This is a paper that came last year uh, describing the work that's been done in 20 European countries that are planning or doing or uh, something related to what they, in one country called programming, another country called coding, another country called computing, and so forth. So, when I start reading this stuff, I said, Jesus, we have so many different thinking. We have logical thinking, mathematical thinking, creative thinking, lateral thinking, blah, blah, blah. And one more, you know, computational thinking. What is that? So my first question to the panel is, what is different about this computational thinking? Do we need another way of thinking? Are we exchanging six for half a dozen? Okay? Second question. How are the different countries implementing computational thinking? Either as a part of a programming course, as a computational thinking course, or computational thinking is integrated into other curriculum activities. So this is what I you know. This is context that uh, we are creating here, and we go in for the panel in the order that we decide here. That first, Celia, and then Gary, and then Mr. Perom. So here's Celia's. Wait. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm delighted to just say a few words, and they will be a few words. And I want to provoke some discussion. Uh, thank you, Jose, for inviting me. I'm going to do the boring bit. I'm going to do the bit about schools. 
Uh, Gary is going to do the bit about all the wonderful things he's doing in the maker community, and Coombe Peron is going to be visionary. But my uh, little contribution is partly I would like to thank uh, Chris Shelton and also Gerald Fuchik, because I had a lot of slides. Uh, about philosophical slides, but there was some little discussion they had this morning in the workshop, and it provoked me to think whether it was mathematical thinking or computational thinking. And as my background is mathematics, I thought, we don't need this new term, so can we go to the next slide? So if we could, we know, inspired by Seymour and so many other people, and the we, by the way, is a lot of people who are in this room, Actually, I wrote them all down who worked, have worked with us, us being Richard Noss and myself in London. It's Ivan Kallas, Anna Isabel Sacrastine, Jose himself, uh, Jenny Sendova from uh, Bulgaria, uh, many other people. Have I missed anybody? Mm, probably. Oh, Ken Khan. Ken Khan. And Dave Pratt. Yes, you're all here. You were all part of this. And I spent the day looking back some of the papers that we wrote. And this is why I'm convinced we don't need another term. We wrote that a powerful way for students to learn mathematics is in their long-term engagement in collaborative projects for which they take responsibility individually and collectively. And the design principles for our collective work, all of us over the years, were sequences of activities at a variety of levels so everybody could engage. Flexible tools, and we meant programming tools, that have adjustable parameters that can be combined in different ways, can be programmed, and allow students to investigate the activity for themselves because they get good feedback. And their collaborative interactions as part of this layered learning sequences activities in multiplayer games or across the web or face to face. Now, I can't remember which paper that came from, but it was a combination of all those people. It's something we've been working on for many years. Now, is that mathematical thinking or is it this new thing, computational thinking? Certainly the way the students think is shaped by the computer tools. So if I have the next one. And I'm just going to show you an example for you to think with, because again, inspired by Chris Shelton's talk and Gerald's interaction. This is a school task that every school in the world will do. You have a, something like, you give three numbers. Here I've got 8, 13, 18. And you say to the children, guess my rule. I think you had Chris guess my number, but let's say it's guess my rule. And so, what we transform this into is some sort of task like this following. So here you have a figural sequence. This is the rule. So it's the same rule, but we made a picture with tiles where we have the first picture, the second picture, and the third picture. And you all being sophisticated adults, you all guess the rule. Can we have the rule? Or one rule. It's the number of tiles is position number times five plus three. So so much so mathematical. But what we wanted to do was program these sequence of tiles. So if we could get the next slide, and so several of us did this. So they would program it, and they would find equivalent rules. This one down there is just one rule. And what knowledge do we need to program these rules? The idea of programming the rules is you're not looking at just the particular examples, the numbers, you're looking at the general structure. And that is mathematics. It really is mathematics. Is you look for structures which are shaped maybe by the computer that you happen to program. But I can't see the difference. And so then you obviously have to worry about the syntax, whether the syntax is the computer program or whether it's mathematics. You have to think about sharing and decoding another's rule. And finally, I say, is this computational thinking? Can I have the next one? Or is this mathematical thinking? And uh, we've always thought it mathematical thinking. I'd like other people to discuss and maybe to convince us that we're wrong. Thank you very much. Let's see if we can switch screens.
they have machine guns. It apparently takes a village. <laughs> we could discuss this question. <laughs> We tested this several times. Any news, any advice? F7. No, as they switch back. I apologize. We'll we'll make it work. I have some I just but I it's necessary to show some images. I'm not touching anything at this point. This was best. That's the trouble. If you know, I left my own devices, it would have been fine. No, no, no way. Don't. Unplug or replug? Not a good idea. Is there an HDMI there? Well, why don't you, you want to do a little discussion? Um, no, I don't. It's too complicated. Sorry. Maybe you could turn to your partners and discuss that question while we're getting the technology to work. Is that all right? To talk. It will make us not feel so bad. <laughs> What's happening? We test this. I know. But so many tapes, so many things for them not to. I don't understand. If that's H, do you have what's coming out of there? On your end. The more, the more people involved, it's always this way. It's gonna work. It's gonna work. No, there's no secret. And it looks good. Oh, thanks. Thanks for your patience. Um, it's truly a privilege and honor to be with all of you today and with my old friends and, and new friend on the panel. And I want to answer Jose's questions a little bit while giving you a sense of optimism about what's actually happening in schools and with the educators that I get to work with and the children as well. Um, one of the things that's changed since I've last been with you at a constructionism conference is I've had the great joy of being able to work in a school regularly. And that's always uh, an opportunity for, for optimism and for um, thinking about thinking. Now, as Celia alluded to this a moment ago, there's a lot of discussions about informal learning and after school programs and gifted and talented. And, and I think, first of all, the logo experience in North America was largely whole classes and whole schools. I know the teachers that, that, I, that are with me from the panel we did a couple of days ago work with all of the students in the school and programming has, has been part of their intellectual diet, as Seymour would say. And I'm not willing to give up on schools because that's where the children are. And I think we have some wisdom and expertise that can really benefit kids, that can introduce new technologies to them and powerful ideas and help kids go further than they could have gone on their own, even with the remarkable affordances of the World Wide Web. One of the, the acts of constructionism that I've been engaged in the last couple of years is publishing books. It turns out that actually having materials that can help people think about thinking and think about their teaching and teach in new ways um, is, is rewarding and powerful and helpful. And the success of our book, Invent to Learn, Making Tinkering and Engineering in the Classroom, really gives me a great deal of, of hope for the future because there's been a remarkable number of educators who have been interested in teaching in a constructionist fashion. 
Now, one of my favorite quotes is one of your countrymen, Sir Joshua Reynolds, who said, there is no expedient to which a man will not resort to the real labor of thinking. This is a quotation that's hanging all over Thomas Edison's laboratory in America. It was his favorite quote as well. And I've modified it for our times of computer science for all um, to say there are no limits to the extremes educators will go to justify not teaching children to program. It's extraordinary how much energy this community has spent trying to convince folks that maybe children should have agency over the computer. Not because it creates job-ready employees, but because it gives children agency over an increasingly intellectual and technologically sophisticated world. So I've given this question of computational thinking a lot of thought because I, like my colleagues, like Brian Harvey, think it's probably just mathematical thinking. And I also get a little nervous when we modify thinking or learning with any adjective or adverb. Those are really good, proud, strong words that stand on their own, that don't need modification. But I thought, well, there's enough smart people who think computational thinking is a thing. What might we actually do with it in classrooms? And the working definition that I've come up with is that computational thinking is useful when modeling is possible, but the programming is too hard. And Brian was saying to me earlier that I'm completely full of it. And I said, I can only come up with one example of this. So there might not be any other examples, and he may be correct. But I've done this with children and teachers as well, that if you take things like iTunes Radio or Spotify or Pandora and say to the children, I'm listening to the song on the left, and I have the option to say, I love this and want to buy it. I listen to it to the end. I say I like it or I skip to the next song, or say I hate it, never playing anything like this again, how does the computer know what to play next? This is impossibly complex for a child to program. It's not impossibly complex for them to take out big sheets of paper and come up with a way of, of creating a system for categorizing and thinking through the, the conditionals of, and variables and such of such a problem. Seymour said in, in my doctoral research that if you can make things with computers, then you can make more interesting things and you can learn a lot more by making them. And some of you are aware, maybe more than others, about the maker movement. Um, let me again just, just remind you that the San Francisco Maker Fair had 150,000 attendees last year. London had 100,000, Rome had 120,000. There's a hunger among parents and kids to create learning environments and experiences that are like what this community is espousing. And, and we need to be build, building bridges between that community and ourselves and Reggio Emilia and ourselves and other similarly minded organizations. But we don't need to, and approaches, but we don't need to repeat the errors of the computer lab where, as Seymour points out, an enthusiastic teacher bought a bought a computer in 1980, brought it into her classroom. The principal saw how excited everyone was and said, well, we need to get 10 more of these because that's all we can afford. And we'll put one in every classroom. But there weren't nine other teachers equally enthusiastic. So we put them in this artificial bunker called the computer lab. And children visit them every fortnight. Um, schools are routinely now spending, I've been told, up to $25 million to build a place where the kids will visit every fortnight to make something. And I like to say that the best maker space is between your ears. If we're constructionists, we want kids engaged in construction of artifacts and objects to think with and interesting problems throughout the school day in every corner of the school. I mentioned this the other day, but if you want to get girls excited about computer programming, I've never seen them more excited than programming of, of something to fly and using Tickle on the iPad and a $65 drone, you can have turtle graphics that smacks into walls and hits people in the head and, and, and does flips in the air. And it's, it's a level of engagement that's quite re remarkable. What about, what about dolls being programmed, Gary? You like that too? I'm okay with programming. Um, so, so I think that the idea is computational thinking um, really is programming or mathematical thinking in 99% of the, of, the, of the cases. But I would just want to share a couple of vignettes of kids and teachers. These are two fifth graders, 10, 11 years old, I met in the United States. They built a marimba out of PVC pipe and wood. 
It's a nice bit of carpentry and engineering. They figured out how to keep the pieces in place without deadening the sound by using sponge. But then they did something quite remarkable. In order to determine what pitch the marimba played, they, they printed out pages of lookup tables and then wrote a scratch program. Because as they explained to me, we were capable of doing the maths. We were just concerned that some of our classmates weren't as clever as us. And we wanted them to participate as well. Which either demonstrates a great deal of hubris or empathy. But what they did to address that was quite extraordinary. They wrote a scratch program that says, what is the frequency of the pitch you're trying to reproduce? And how wide is the tube you're using? And then the scratch program tells you how long to cut the tube. And what I loved about that was they were using computer programming in an instrumental fashion to solve another problem. And after they showed their, their handiwork to 500 adoring educators who congratulated them for being geniuses, I snuck up behind them and said, it seems like a real pain that I have to go through this pile of papers you printed out off the internet to figure out the frequency that I want to reproduce. Why can't I type B flat? After all, it's a marimba. And they went, oh, and ran away with their laptop. And I was receiving email for the next few days about the progress that they were making. That was because I knew something about programming. I also knew that it was within their zone of proximal development to be able to solve that problem for themselves. So we can take an environment like Turtle Art and we can do things that have never been possible in this community. Like, we can create a beautiful image that's simply executed, where kids are learning a lot of mathematics in a concrete fashion. But then, if we export our Islamic tiling pattern, as these fourth graders did, and we convert the file format, and open it in Tinkercad, and extrude the image, take the 2D and make it 3D, we can then send that to a 3D printer, and make these beautiful cookie cutters, and we can play with clay. Or if we're given ceramic clay, they can stamp these, hand, fire them, hand paint them, and create these extraordinarily beautiful, mathematically complex artifacts that they can cherish, that their parents can love. Many of you are familiar with Seymour's parables about the difference between the, the sculpture a kid creates in art class that he brings home and his mother keeps to show at the wedding or hangs on the wall, or it's a, it, has a, it earns a position of pride and status in the home, and how that's compared to what a kid does in a mathematics classroom. Well, in this case, there's three things I love about this project. The first is, in the 15 seconds I showed it to you, you now know how to do it yourself. The second thing is that it goes from the screen to something you can hold in your hands. And many of you who are mathematics teachers may have a yellowing Escher painting in the corner of the room that you tell the children is mathematics and they may or may not believe you. But this is impossible to create without starting with mathematics. So I work with teachers. This is teachers using the Makey Makey and Scratch so that when you point to a place on your body with conductive thread and metal snaps, a video will play explaining that anatomical system. Or on the right, a young music teacher who had never done anything with technology before used a purloined um, hotel luggage trolley and conductive thread to make a harp that was programmed in the exact same fashion. And there she is explaining it to the great constructivist educator, Eleanor Duckworth. We had teachers at our summer institute constructing modern knowledge two years ago who said, we want to make a system that will water plants when they get thirsty. So a few years ago, you might have been able to make a Lego machine that poured a bottle. And once that was successful, they connected an Arduino to it. But they needed to measure moisture. How do you measure moisture? Well, you connect two nails, and you learn that when the soil is wet, there's less resistance than when it's dry. And then when you have that incremental success, you decide the system shouldn't water the plant when it's daytime because you don't want the water to be wasted and evaporate. So with every success, you're encouraged to test a larger hypothesis, ask a deeper question, embellish, decorate. And with un when you're unsuccessful, you have to engage in some debugging processes. This was created in four days by teachers who had never done any of this without any instruction. And then this image comes from when they were explaining to me what they did. And they rather matter-of-factly said, once we determined the distance that the nails needed to be apart, 
we just drew and printed a nail separator. 12 months earlier, these teachers would have looked at a 3D printer like a chimp discovering fire. Now it's just part of what you use to express your ideas, and it's wholly consistent with constructionism. So teachers work on whimsical things like this. Now this was based on, we asked them, can you just document what you did? We, we imagined a couple stills, and we end up with these motion pictures. Now, now the video gets applause. That's the part iMovie does, right? The computer did that part. Everything from having to find every piece of cardboard within an hour of Boston to working with a half dozen robotic systems to pro learning how to program them, to synchronize them together in this incredibly whimsical context um, was something a kindergartner might do or an adult, but the idea of lifelong kindergarten and constructionism, I think, is important embodied in that. This is a dress that responds to sound, so it lights up with music or noise. And what's significant about this is, not that the system responds to sound, that they learned how to program sensors, but that it's a dress. It's tailored, it's beautiful, it's a real thing. And we can now make real things that are beautiful, that are powerful, that, are, that, that re respect and honor the intentions of children. Um, one last story I want to share. I've had a couple of instances where I've looked at these national curricula and computer science for all things, and I continuously find essential problems and concepts that we confront in this community regularly that don't even get mentioned. So for one, I'm working with the Hummingbird Robotics Kit, a lovely interface for working with Snap or Scratch to build, to build robots out of junk, recycled materials, cardboard, with motors, lights, sensors, and using a real, a real programming language that's appropriate for learning, like Scratch or Snap, as opposed to the awful Arduino C that kids are being compelled to use, where they can, in fact, change parameters or variables or values, but I've yet to see a child make a program from scratch. And I think computational thinking requires the ability to make something from a blank screen. So the one example that, that I've seen in a number of cases is you have a potentiometer, a knob, and when you turn the knob, you want the turtle to turn. So what's the first thing you have to do? You have to identify what kind of data are you getting from the sensor. Well, in the case of the hummingbird, the knob gives you a zero to 100. Ask a child to then write a program that when you turn the knob, the turn, turtle will turn all the way around based on you turning the physical knob. 3.6 times the value of the sensor is unbelievably hard for children. And yet, fundamental to, to dealing in a, with cybernetics. I've been working in rural Arkansas, and I had this idea, actually Amy DeGray, my, my colleague and friend, and I were at Disneyland a few years ago. And how many of you have been to Disneyland or Disney World? or? So there's an attraction there called the Enchanted Tiki Room. The only time you go to it is when it's 45 degrees outside and the line for all the other good rides are too long. But it's a room where you, the lights get dark and robot birds come down from the sky and they sing and dance together. And about five years ago, Amy and I were there and we went in the Tiki Room and I watched the birds sing and dance and I said, we are this close to being able to do it with children. And we now can do it with children. So I said to these teachers in rural Arkansas, one of the members of this group literally didn't know the difference between greater than and less than. She would scrunch up her face and say, is the crocodile's mouth this way or that way? But she had no working idea of the concept. And I just gave them the very simple prompt, make a bird that sings and dances. 
And in 90 minutes, this is one of the projects. <laughs> so there's a, a distant That's sensor hilarious. in the front. Never send a monkey to do a bird's job. <laughs> and it matches how ugly so, he is. <laughs> so they're using the distant sensor so that when an intruder approaches, the bird says, never send a monkey to do a, a, a man's job. Um, and there were other birds that sang and danced, and he digitized audio, and he did it all within 90 minutes from this very strong prompt where everyone knew what a bird was so everyone could have, have success. The finding out what data you get and at what point is that too close, that dealing with thresholds issue, whether it's mathematical thing, your computational thing, your computer science, um, is more sophisticated than anything any child was doing in that state that day in a maths class. And for teachers who had been perennial school failures and math phobes, um, this was something accessible to them. One, one quick related story. I, I suggested in another workshop with teachers, they build a vending machine. Again, because everyone knows what a vending machine does. And one group of teachers had a stuffed giraffe. And, and I apologize for the imagery here, but they wanted to make it vomit gumballs. That when you threw the switch or put a coin in, it would puke up gumballs. Well, it turns out that puking gumballs is hard, but pooping them is easy. Why? Gravity. And I'd see more would love this story because it led to all these discussions about, well, I wonder if that's why mammals have evolved that way. So we had this simple, whimsical prompt and cybernetic constructionist materials that made it possible. So just quickly, the things I'm thinking most about, what's the smallest seed we can plant that generates the largest blossom, the most beautiful garden, and when we intervene on, with kids? If we're thinking about computer science for all, when did a children get to learn a concept and reuse it in another context? When did they get to see it again? Because we're constantly rushing them and moving through, through topics. You know, I, I often wonder, even when I go to conferences like this and I see people who I respect say, we did this for two minutes or two days or two hours or two weeks, and look how amazing the kids are. And I wonder, when do they get to do something longer than the course of an antibiotic? Are, are, when, when are we going to become serious enough about this? And one of my favorite literary discoveries recently is a book by Angelo Petri. He was an Italian immigrant to New York City who wrote a book called Schoolmaster of the Great City a hundred years ago. And in it, he identifies and solves every problem in education. And one of the most beautiful quotes is he says, I, I don't remember a school ever staying with a beautiful idea long enough to have it become an important part of children's lives. We don't know, even this community don't know what the kids are capable of because we don't give them enough of a chance. We don't have enough time or focus. So just a couple things to look, look at. This is a Raspberry Pi Zero. This is a PC that costs $5. It runs Scratch or Python. It can run Brian's curriculum. Um, it's $5. Let's cut it out with the excuses about we can't afford or we can't do. And I meet kids who have a school bag full of these, and none of the teachers know that they know something. Um, I'm not a big fan of the iPad because of its Apple's limitations on it that created what Alan Kay called asymmetric creation. The software developers get to make things, but nobody else does. But there's a Taiwanese computer science professor who created a really lovely version of Scratch called Tickle on the iPad. And what's significant about it was he figured out that it could work with drones and Spheros and BB-8s and lights and all kinds of toys and automation devices that are in the marketplace. So now we can, again, take Logo out of the computer to do the 20 things to do with the computer that, that Cynthia and Seymour wrote about 45 years ago. And, and the last thing is, if you haven't seen Wolfram Language, Stephen Wolfram's programming language for making the whole world computationally possible, um, there's a YouTube video you need to watch called Introduction to, to Wolfram Language that caused me to have a great deal of excitement and to be very sad because I don't know how we're going to ever get it into schools. But it, it does everything. And, and Brian is in talks with them to maybe have Snap work with it, et cetera. But it's, it's mind-blowing, and it's the kind of thing that this community really ought to take advantage of. And I just have this last slide, if we can just leave this up and people can ponder it. But it was Seymour's admonition 26 years ago to an educational technology conference in, in Australia, where he was reminding us then 
that we're the revolutionaries and the visionaries and that we shouldn't be subservient to, to the medieval school practices that we're trying to accommodate and integrate our ideas into. Um, in a lot of ways, I think this is the best of times. We have extraordinary materials. We have parents and kids, even people in government and industry who are excited about learning by making, and we could tell them that's called constructionism, and we know something about that. But it's also the worst of times. The best teachers I know at doing this are miserable in their jobs because they've been moved from being revolutionaries to being plumbers. And I think we need to take Seymour's advice from a quarter century ago and reclaim the work that we do. I thank you all for your patience and for the work you do on behalf of kids, and it's a great honor to be with you. Thanks. Any questions to Gary? <laughs> no. Uh, this is not really a question, it's an observation, um, which is that I'm not sure what computational thinking is, I'm not even sure what mathematical thinking is, but I am sure that the relationship between the two is changing all the time. Two weeks ago, there was great excitement in one of the world's great universities because they discovered the next biggest prime number. Now, what is that? Who the hell wants to know the next biggest prime number? Well, your credit card wouldn't work if we didn't keep doing it. But then it's supposed to be pure mathematics because prime numbers come into that. So I think the question ought to be, what's the relation of computational and mathematical thinking this week? Hey, let's only take one second because, in fact, that problem is hugely important. It was completely inaccessible to 10-year-olds in the past, and it may no longer be inaccessible to 10-year-olds. Thank you. I was thinking about your question, Celia, with these patterns and numbers. And I don't think that it's, it's very difficult to really distinguish between mathematical thinking and computational thinking. But I think that from my point of view, your task is interesting because I think about how to represent the process which will give me the result. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, I came with four programs to, to compute this result, which are using incredibly different computational approach. Mm -hmm. And this is interesting for me. The number, not the result, not so much, and there are, there might be so many interesting questions about each of this approach. So there is a lot of in common, but I think the main interest in computational thinking is the object to think with is the representation of the process to solve the problem. Can I just say one thing? Thank you, Ivan. I, it's a very boring task, but when kids engage with it in this sort of programming environment, it's very exciting. And I think, I actually, I don't really care what we call it, but what I really don't like, and you know me, is to think that mathematical thinking is all the boring stuff that you do in mathematics, and computational thinking is all the wonderful stuff that Gary is doing outside, and I want to reclaim some of that ground for us. Do you want to say something? Any questions? And, 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 and there's also this dichotomy. We were having an argument with Conrad Wolfram, a mathematics educator, recently. Yeah. They were arguing about the, the definition of real world. Yeah. Like, could, could falling in love with mathematics be real world? And I think what we're really just talking about is meaningful context, yeah. which may have also been a Seymour term. Yeah. Brian wants to yeah. say something. Oh, he's first. I've got two. <laughs> I think. Aren't you first? Or am I first? No, go go okay, I'm first. Um, <laughs> so, two things about that sequence of numbers. Um, uh, one of them actually bounces off, uh, Ivan, what you said, um, about uh, not caring about what the answer is, but caring about the process. Um, and that's an approach that everybody understands in certain situations. I mean, when you do a crossword puzzle, everybody knows 
that you're not doing it because it's really going to change your life to find out what six across is, <laughs> right? It's the process of solving it that's of interest. And um, to some people, yeah, yeah, fine. Um, but kids who hate math, I think, don't get it because they haven't. Their teachers don't get it, and the curriculum writers don't get it. That mathematics is that sort of game. You know, we try to tell them, the kids, that um, you know they're studying this so that when they go to the grocery store they can blah 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 blah, <laughs> right? Uh, or so that when they get a job as a carpenter they can blah 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 blah. Um, we don't tell them, at least some of us don't tell them that uh, they're playing a game like crossword puzzles or like Minecraft or, you know, like 2048, right? Which is this amazingly popular uh, pure mathematics game. Um, so that, that was one comment that came off of that, which is that, that uh, what you need to reclaim for mathematical thinking is its gamefulness. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. Um, but the other thing was, I was a little confused because when you went from guess my rule to putting up those pictures, you kind of reversed the problem. Mm -hmm. and when, it, when it's the numbers that you're looking at, you have to figure out the rule. But when you're looking at those pictures, the pictures embody the rule. Uh, I have to answer that because I'm sorry to... It's on, it's on. Is it on? Uh, Yes, the pictures embody the rule if you're Brian Harvey or if you're quite an experienced mathematical thinker. There are a lot of people who will look at the pictures and count the number of tiles in them and then look at the numbers. So well, the whole point about this rather tedious school task is to say mathematics is about looking at the structure that, as Ivan says, you then represent in your program. So it's not very interesting, but when kids do it differently and see those figures differently, they have a really good discussion and I think they then make it so it's a little bit about the school end of your maker movement I, so. I will admit I did it that way really? okay. I looked at it in a, in a dummy way okay. and, 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 I'll, and, I'll, and I'll speak up for I'll speak for a colleague of ours who's unfortunately not here but Edith Ackerman said at the end of our summer institute last year that, that perhaps making is seeing and, and so that might be related to what you're saying as well, is, is part of the process is seeing what's happening or observing the phenomenon. And Gary, I don't see any reason why kids can't program Pandora, but we can argue about that later. <laughs> they, they might make a really cool, simple version, but it, it's, even that's kind of hard. I, 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 hope you're tr I hope you're right, but I don't know where we'll find the time or the... It's gathering the data that's the hard part there. Right. Um. So I, w I want you to just make a comment about uh, a phenomenon that I think is, is, you know, at least something you should be concerned about. And it reminds me of that story from, like, you know, the, in Germany during the, the the rise of you know the the, the Nazi uh, regime. That first they came for your books, then they came, and then finally, I mean, finally they, they burned the books, then they. You know that kind of story. So, when I saw that the paper that I think was shown, the, the computational thinking paper from 2006, you know, for me that was like, oh, now they are sort of burning our books, and and they will come for us later. Uh, so, I mean, maybe because I'm from Brazil, I like conspiracy theories, and <laughs> but maybe I'm overdoing it. But anyways, so, but what I want to say is that. Uh, you know, first, what I think computational thinking as a term did was to uh, they captured the language, so they renamed something that was you know computational literacy or programming in 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 a term that was disconnected from the history of the actual thing that they were talking about, and you know some people say oh that 's fine, but then you know this person who wrote the paper, she was a powerful national science. National Science Foundation officer, and she had a lot of money to distribute to academics, and then everyone say, oh, that's great, she has money, so we'll, we'll just do whatever she wants. And then people started using this term, and 
you know, some people didn't cite constructionist literature on purpose because they didn't want to get burned with that kind of the old stuff, you know, that's... Uh, and, and the result of that, I don't know, you know maybe that's... I'm over... Um, you know, I, I'm seeing too much into it. But I think the result is code.org of that thing that happened 10 years ago, which is, you know, first they captured the language, then they come for the tools, because they have a tool now, code.org has their own programming tool. Now they're producing, as Brian said, their own curricula and all of that. So it's not like... And best of all, you don't need a computer. Right. And then the, the next thing is, you know, you know so I, I mean, my, my thing here is just to say that, you know, I think we need to be more vocal about those things. And we have people in our community uh, that are here, but other people like Mitch and, uh, you know, who has you know, a lot of gravitas and he can, you know, reach a lot of people because of the Media Lab popularity and all of that. And, you know, he has been doing some of that, but I think, I mean, we need to do more because this has consequences, real consequences, that now people say, oh, computer science is one hour a year, and people say, we're done with that, and all of that. So it's not like just for our own pride or ego that, oh, they're taking, it, it, it's really harming kids in very real ways, because it's changing the character of teaching computer science worldwide, and, uh, and there are not that many people who can speak out against this whole and, process. And, and can I add to your conspiracy theory? The funders of a lot of these efforts are people who have a clear, stated, historically provable antipathy towards public education, which isn't, which isn't a small thing. So they're saying, look over here, are kids coding. Look over here, we're destroying neighborhoods. Um, just point that out there. Yeah, but I think you have to consider that, you know, probably in the States, most of what we were saying is correct. Yeah. But in other countries, uh, we know, for example, in Italy, they are doing something that's very much related to what they are doing in the curriculum, <laughs> using technology to do all kinds of stuff, not just, you know. One thing that I'm thinking that when you do math in a blackboard or a piece of paper, I think it's different than what you're saying that you can program because all the debugging, all that stuff that comes with the, 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 the tool, the, the computer tool. So I don't know what, what when Celia means. What you, when you say mathematical thinking, is the mathematical thinking that you do in the blackboard? Because when you do things in the blackboard, you need somebody else to look at that and see if that thing is working. When I do that in the computer, the computer tells me something that I can reflect upon and try to debug. And th that's, to me, the, the beginning of this difference between doing things on paper and doing things with the computer. And I don't know if you are doing something in your brains when you do that. things in the computer, because after we've done that in the computer, we start thinking a different way. I don't know if this deserves a different term for you no know, computational thinking, but as we play with the computer, we are not the same as when we play with pencil and paper. Are you saying it's external versus internal? Right there. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I see. It's not the same. Oh. It's not the same. I mean, I actually agree that it's not the same, and lots of very learned sort of papers have been written about this, as you well know. But I just think that I don't want to define all the dynamic and all the programming and all the making mathematics more concrete and accessible. Put, say, this is computational. There's undoubtedly, if you frame your mathematics with a representation of some computer representation, it will change it. And we are in great danger of having mathematics, the blackboard stuff. We were talking at lunchtime about learning your tables. All that's definitely maths, because everybody knows that. I would like to say that's not mathematical thinking. That's procedural rote learning. And what we're doing is something that's more mathematical thinking. But we could debate forever. Well, uh, but at least I know that mathematics has had a proud history, and we can reclaim this territory. It was a very lovely anecdote that Conrad Wolfram tells in his TED talk where he, he said that his daughter was eight years old and she was taking pieces of paper, folding it, and making paper laptops where the keyboard was down here and the display was on top. And after observing her doing that for a while, he asked her, um, I didn't make paper laptops as a 
the young boy, why do you think that is? And she answered, no paper. <laughs> and, and the notion that because paper came before computers means that doing it on paper is foundational is, is also preposterous that we need to push up. Absolutely. I think uh, Cynthia and I have that. Mic, next. What is? Where'd the mics go? Non sequitur uh, statements. Um, I don't know what computational thinking is. I read that thing and I thought she was off the wall. <laughs> and that what I when I talk to people. Apparently, computational thinking has nothing to do with computers. It has to do with something else. And I couldn't figure out what that something else was. <laughs> but Gary, my dear, I want to take exception to you about um, computer labs. Because I've been in schools and worked in computer oh, labs, computer lab. and fab other lab. people exactly. have, they're fabulous. Or they, they're terrible, but they're not something to do away with. People with expertise. It's like saying, the chem, let's, get, let's get rid of chemistry labs, put it in the classroom, and have the regular teacher teach chemistry so it could be part of yeah, every piece of the curriculum. Okay? I really, really think that um, what's done with, where's Tracy, uh, couldn't be done by a classroom teacher. It needs a special place. Thank you. Uh, let me ask you a question. The movie, the digit, uh, narrative that we saw, was done using which uh, software? iMovie. Do you consider that programming? No. Why and, not? And, and even less, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it's a bad thing, and I think it's useful, and I think particularly in that example, um, the way it came to be was, we now have so many people coming to the Institute that there's no way to show everything that's been done. So we just asked people if they can make some sort of movie and upload it to a website. And the reason why something that looks that polished is possible is because the software is doing all of it. And do you think when she did that was from beginning to the end, that's it? No debugging? There were, there were minutes worth of debugging. These people were working on a physical programming project, engineering a programming project for four days, and in literally in a couple of minutes, they assembled that movie. That doesn't mean that that's a bad thing, but I don't think it has the level of depth. I, I know that when I learned how to program as a kid, I, I remember spending dozens or hundreds of hours on problems and programs, and, make, and they were big, and, they, and every, with every success, you, you built upon that with every, you know, with every challenge, you were engaged in debugging. I think we're rushing too much. And I'm not saying, I think filmmaking is brilliant. I think it's constructivist. I think it's, it's creative. I think it, all of that. I, don't, I, don't, I, I, I would be afraid of calling anything that, that's good programming, just as I'm concerned about calling everything computational thinking or dis, you know, turning learning into discovery learning, inquiry learning, cooperative learning, collaborative learning. Right? When we've got learning and thinking, and those are good, and we know what they're, they mean, and they're time-honored yes. terms. Can I add to that? I think... There's like disembodied voices. <laughs> I'm back here. Okay. Okay, so um, you just pulled some passion out of me when you were talking about the iMovie thing. So I think the real problem with iMovie is that it's proprietary software. So they can't, they will never have the license to be able to look at the source code of it or, or contribute to its development. And so, you know, they can make a movie on it and uh, unfortunately, they won't know how the tool is actually working. And that's actually a problem with a lot of these devices, like the iPad, which you showed up there as well. Um, but every system, uh, at, the, at the risk of getting into this jihad, at, every system has a level of opacity. And, and one of the decisions you make as an educator, as a curriculum designer, is what level of opacity is acceptable. 
It's great if there's a system that, that, that you can see all the way down to the bottom as long as that complexity doesn't interfere with what people would do at developmentally appropriate levels. But, I mean, I, the point, the larger point I was trying to, and, and filmmaking is rich and, and powerful and important as is music composition and other things. But if we're talking here about computation, I think there's, you can't, dif you can't differentiate that from computing. Um, I'd well, like to... No, no, I mean, you mean programming. So, <coughs> here I am. So, in um, Stephen Wolfram's book, A New Kind of Science, in the first page or two, he talks about how for 300 years, science advanced so much because of being able to use mathematical equations to understand the world, and then says, but now we've got a way to understand the world that's computational, that gives us so much more as a way to understand things. Now, to my mind, I feel like there's a useful distinction between the words mathematical and computational, but I also feel like I don't feel like it's worth arguing if somebody says mathematics includes all of computation and the processes and understanding processes and structure, like Ivan was talking about, that that's just part of mathematics and we're calling it. But I think that the world doesn't use the word mathematics in that way. Even, I'm not talking about school mathematics, even the mathematics that mathematicians do isn't the kind of stuff that Ivan was just talking about. So I think there, that in terms of the way the world uses the word computation and mathematics, that there's some value to talking about computational thinking. Well, and along the lines of what Cynthia was saying, if, you want, if I wanted to stipulate that Cynthia is right about expertise, it's not clear to me that we can trust math teachers with this. If I wanted to say something that outrageous, right? That there's been generations of harm done by, I, I wrote an essay recently where I said, I've, no, I've spent a lot of time in my life with math, mathematicians. They've never made me feel stupid. Plenty of math teachers did. I've hung out with Wolfram and with Conway and with Brian Silverman and with Celia and people who are, who are actual mathematicians. The, 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 the field of mathematics education has been about ranking and sorting for too long. And, and if, we're, we wanna, if, we, if we're gonna trust that this distinction doesn't matter, where we place it in the, in the school day, I think, is, is important. One more question, then we're gonna have a Mr. Perron. One more question. Oh. Mr. Perron. I have been listening for four days. You people concentrated on teaching and learning constructionism in school, but not utilizing constructionism to all walks of life in the country. We have to do it because we are developing countries. The government has asked us to modify 20 chemistry lab of government school to fab lab with the help of Paolo, Rogers, and Nalin. And I would like to pass my buck to Rogers to talk more about it. So just in case you were wondering why I was coming up and going down again, he was like, Roger, come here. I think you talk about this and, you know. <laughs> oh, Roger, another point you should make is this, tell this story, so. Okay, so let's see how, go, how it goes. All right, so um, the message Kun Paron would like me to say, um, I think probably um, is represented very well from a story. So a village that we work in, worked with in uh, um, eastern part of Thailand, um, you might recall the household accounting project um, there that was done um, with the villages. Um, so that they can um, uh, reflect upon how they uh, spend and how they earn money. And one of the villages who uh, did this project, um, first they did it on paper, wasn't very successful, and then we moved on to the computer. In that case, it was Excel. And the experience after a while uh, that we got was that, finally, accounting was a blur for me, but now with this thing, 
finally, I can grab something that used to be in the air and I can actually put it somewhere that is meaningful to me. Right? So I think that reflects the kind of computational thinking that he wants to um, um, deliver, which is probably um, close to what Ken mentioned about having a new view of looking at the world. But you might notice that the context is a little bit different than uh, a lot of the examples that we were discussing about. Um, Seymour talks about doing personally meaningful projects. And projects like this that we did um, with villages are personally meaningful and also personally critical. Right? So, uh, you know, you might, in schools, you might have to come up with an idea of doing like a castle um, so that you can have something enjoyable to do and then you would learn important ideas. Um, but with the kinds of stuff that we had the opportunity to do, once you succeed, you actually create real changes in people's lives and it has long-term effects. So he thinks there's an opportunity um, here. Um, you know, it's not in a context of a school, but he believes that constructionism is a very powerful idea and sometimes schools is the most difficult place for it to flourish. Like it's so good, but you try harder and harder and harder, but it, people still say no. But when you try it in another context, and this is where he has done it um, extensively, you see real changes and people really take it on. And in Thailand, in the private sectors, you know, like the petrochemical companies, um, Siam Cement Group, when you apply these ideas, they like catch on fire. Well, maybe because it saves them billions of bots, mm -hmm. right? But it works and people really take it in. So um, I think that's, that's the experience that he wants to share. Yeah, yeah so... Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> so the problem in countries like Thailand and other developing countries is that, you know, um, the rich and the poor are so divided. Um, so it's, it's very important to, to um, uh, narrow this gap. So working in and out of schools, you know, in industries, getting the ideas out is really a critical thing to, to um, improve that situation. Okay? Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ms. Perron. Thank you, Celia. Thank you, Gary. Oh. Yeah. Honorable guests, we have reached the end of this conference. I have not been to the previous constructionism conferences. I hope we have lived up to the expectation. I would like to thank everyone who have spent endless hours in making sure we have everything together. This includes the conference committee, the Drun Sikhalai teachers, administrator, and Drun Sikhalai students. But most importantly, I thank you all for traveling so far to be here and share with us your wonderful work. I hope you have a safe trip home. If uh, possible, I will send someone to see you all in Lithuania in the next two years. If I am still alive, I will go there. Thank you very much. Can I say one thing? If a few of us really want to say thank you very much okay. to Kumparan and all his team. And could we also thank Roger? Uh, and Elin, yes, thank you. How do you pronounce her name? Elin. Nalin. Nalin as well. Thank you. Sorry.